This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with Roger Scruton his latest book on human nature. Roger Scruton certainly needs no introduction. This is now his fourth appearance uh, on Liberty Law Talk, and you know, he is uh, an immense writer. He writes on politics, morality, beauty, architecture, music, uh, pretty much everything that human beings want to understand at a deep level. Uh, he can tell you about it. And um, Roger, we are delighted to have you on the program today to, to discuss this book. Well, 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 thank you very much. I, I'm very pleased to be here on the program. So, Roger, thinking about the book on human nature, it seems to me, uh, from my vantage point, there are two contradictory understandings of the human person that one finds educated classes in the West articulate. And I think this relates to your book. On the one hand, we're told evolutionary biology, uh, evolutionary concepts uh, totally are, are completely sufficient to help us understand who we are as human beings. So there is nothing we do that is not explainable ultimately by some sort of uh, adaptation, uh, you know, factual uh, understanding. And then these same people, without missing a beat, uh, will then assert in the next breath that we are emancipated, autonomous individuals, completely free to do what we will, so long as we don't hurt another person. Uh, Roger, help us mm. understand, am, am I right uh, in this observation? And are these things as contradictory as I think? Uh, how did we get to this point? Well, it's a very interesting observation. It is true that there's a kind of contradiction here. Um, obviously, uh, to say that we're completely free to uh, live as we want, provided we do no harm, um, is the fundamental libertarian liberal doctrine. Um, but, you know, when you live in that way, um, you are apt to feel guilty as well, and you need excuses. And the best possible excuse is that, you know, that you're simply a, 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 an evolutionary, evolutionarily determined organism, that, that you know, actually uh, you couldn't help it. You were bound to be this way because that's the way you've been made by your physical makeup. So don't worry that by living freely, you also um, do all kinds of things that you wouldn't otherwise have approved of. You should forget, it, forget all the guilt and just get on with it. So, so the scientific picture is used to remove the guilt. Uh, and the, uh, the free picture, the picture of us as free uh, individuals, is used to, to, put, to commit the sins. It's a jolly good combination. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, thinking about here, why is it your book, you expound at some length on why uh, evolutionary adaptation, these sorts of scientific ideas, uh, while, while not wrong, and you know, certainly you're not anti-evolution, but don't, don't add up ultimately to give us a complete yeah. understanding of human understanding and of human action and behavior. I mean, even me using the word concept to talk about an evolutionary idea, that in and yeah. itself could be seen as a contradiction. Well, the, this is um, my, my, the basic structure of my argument is that while we are animals, uh, and evolved animals. And while the theory of evolution does create, give a, a general explanation uh, of our biological makeup, uh, there is an extra to this. Uh, but partly because of the complexity of our behavior, uh, we uh, can be understood in a completely different way and interact with each other in a completely different way. It's as though a new uh, reality emerges from the gradual complexity of the uh, um, biological development. In something like the way, you know, when, when someone paints a, a picture, uh, a, a portrait, say, he puts dabs, pieces of pigment onto a canvas one after another, and you don't know what's happening. It just all looks like, uh, like um, can bits of pigment on a canvas, and then suddenly a face emerges. Uh, you don't know how it happened. It, it only happened because more bits of pigment were being added. But nevertheless, there's a, a transition into a new 
level of being, so to speak, when that face appears. Now you can understand this in a completely different way. You understand it using the ideas of, uh, of the person, uh, of, uh, of beauty and duty and, uh, you know, and uh, the meaning of life and so on, all those things which we normally reserve for, for talking about each other. So I think it's something similar with the human being at a certain stage of evolutionary development. Uh, there emerges what you might call the face of the person on the body of the human. Well, thinking about uh, you know, this idea, we, we started with two different concepts. So we, you talk a lot in the book about uh, the philosopher Immanuel Kant and uh, his mm-hmm. notion of rights, of personhood, of autonomy, and of, of understanding our duties uh, and obligations to others, and also you, you know, this word of interpersonal, of, of accountability, and that this is, in a yeah. way, sort of the ground... Uh, of freedom or, or the way to think about freedom. So what, what is that though? Is that, are you, how then are you at odds uh, with sort of the, the liberal, modern liberal account of personhood of contract and consent being sort of the, the sum total of how we relate to other people? Well, uh, I'm not uh, opposed to the idea that contract and consent are, are deeply embedded in the human condition, that this is part of what we are, and it's part of what makes it possible for us to solve our problems in the way that animals can't solve their problems. We can solve our problems by agreements, uh, and we can take those agreements to be binding. We can lay down a law that we all consent to, and so on. And we know that this is a fantastic achievement. It means we can live with each other even if we don't know each other at all, we can live with each other uh, with some kind of guarantee of peace between us. Uh, so I, I, w- I, would, I would accept that, that this is part of what is true in the whole liberal inheritance, you know, that, uh, that we are creatures who settle their problems by contract and consent. But that's not all we are. I mean, I, I also want to say that we have a, a, a deep sense of, of of the meaning of the other person, of the other person being in some sense sacred to us, we ha- we don't have um, the either the right or even the possibility, moral possibility of of taking another's life away. We are uh, it, it, we stand in a in a kind of awe towards each other, uh, and we also recognise in the world around us. Uh, the the marks of uh, of sacred and forbidden and necessary things we don't necessarily articulate this in the way that uh, religions do but we, there's an urge in all of us to uh, towards this and perhaps to articulate it if we can through art and music and uh, and uh, poetry and the rest thinking about the something you said uh, the emergence uh, you, you use the term emergent uh, in mm. in connection with say the, you know the human face uh, or you know, with 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 human language, or the the awareness that we're dealing with another subject uh, of of emotions, of responses, of of accountability. So talk about that for a minute. What when you say emergent, is this sort of a dualistic account that something I lay on top of my body, uh, mm. spirit? Uh, well, talk talk about because you know there's all sorts of interesting complications problems there. And I'm just, I was curious to go, as I was reading your book, I was thinking, what does he mean by emergent? I mean, is that, does, I mean, one, as I was thinking, that could mean, so Richard Dawkins or, you know, has his account, uh, but Roger Scruton has his account and they both seem sufficient for their purposes thereof, but which one's true? Well, I, I think, um, the, but by referring to emergent uh, features of the world. I mean that these features emerge from something. The thing that they emerge from is a necessary foundation, okay. but it isn't a sufficient um, thing to to account for for what they are. Um, as, as again, I would say the the case of the face emerging from the the coloured patches on the canvas is an example of this. I, I, I would you can call this dualism if you like. But, uh, and I will, I'm inclined to say, as I do in other writings, that 
that there's a sort of cognitive dualism, that we can understand the world in two ways, but the thing that we're understanding, you know, in one sense as a biological organism, in the other sense as a person, that thing is one thing. It's one thing understood in two ways. Uh, and perhaps the simplest example is, is music. You know, if, if you're a, a, an acu acoustician, someone who's a real expert on sounds, you um, you might be able to have a complete mastery of how to how to uh, describe and explain sounds in a sequence, you know, one after another, and that's you're describing everything that there is. But but you might also be tone deaf. You might not hear the melody in those sounds because that's a, a completely different way of looking at the, the the same thing. So that music is something that we hear in the sounds, but it's nothing more than the sounds. And um, likewise, the, the, the human soul is something that we encounter in the human being, but it's, not, it, but it's nothing more than the human being, but the human being understood in, in, in a complete way, so to speak. Thinking about, you, you talk a lot about the adaptation strategies. I mean, we've had the, the evolutionary adaptation, um, you know, mm. anthropology, I don't know. And you talk a lot in the book about how, and you know, you've said here, that this gets us so far, and you want to you talk mm. about things in the book that, you know, now they they do try and explain everything uh, with this notion, uh, and even this yeah. concept of memes. You talk about things like music, yeah. laughter, uh, a view, uh, uh, a paintings, uh, the 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 experience we have of, of mm. viewing a painting, as things that really can't be explained. Uh, by evolutionary yeah. biology, or at least not, not in a way that goes toward our, uh, you know, s successful survival as a as a species or or as a group, uh, and even something like you talk about war, uh, a, a little bit, mm. which would seem totally explainable by and uh, on one level, and yet uh, you talk about the which I think is true, the duties and the rights that uh, combatants in a unit. Uh, share with one another, yeah. whereby they overcome even fear itself by duty. So may, maybe yeah. bring out that a little bit, because I think that's that's on my mind, and that's something that I hear as I, you know, travel and talk uh, in various circles. Yeah. Is this this the the memes the, the memes approach uh, seems to be uh, really asserting itself? Right. Well, just hang on a minute. All right. sorry, sorry about that. Um, yes. The, the this is really difficult because it, take the case of altruism. You know, the, we all are familiar now with the um, evolutionary explanation of altruism. You know, you can give a, an account in terms of game theory, which shows that genes who produce altruistic um, avatars, so to speak, um, have a uh, uh, an adaptation which gives them a, an advantage in the competition for scarce resources. Uh, and so, you know, there's an explanation of why it is that there's, that the animals are altruistic, not only towards their own kin, which would be obvious, but also to the groups in which they find themselves, you know, um, that, they're, that they're increasing the survival chances of their genes by doing this. Um, but that doesn't explain in any way what happens when human beings uh, make sacrifices for each other? Um, when, when a mother sacrifices herself for her child or a, a, a soldier for, the, for his uh, comrades in the unit that are fighting, he, he is doing something because he knows it to be right, or she knows it to be right, uh, and is compelled to make a gift a gift towards others, and knowing the full extent of the cost of this, and yet, uh, as it were, overcoming fear and all the rest in order to do this. It's a completely different motive. It's a motive which, uh, as it were, uh, involves a shining light in front of you, which is, which is pulling you on away from your biological nature uh, it, it, towards a higher conception of yourself. And that, that kind of motive is there all the time in our daily behavior, you might say the result of having this motive is just the same as the result of altruism in animals, and that may be true, but it doesn't um, explain how it is that we understand it 
and why it is that we admire each other, condemn each other, uh, and, and form whole networks of relations on the basis of this kind of motive. So, you know, we've moved into another sphere, that's what I would want to say, and that other sphere has a logic of its own. Uh, th thinking here, uh, it, it seems to me, one you know, a, a problem, as, as I was reading your account, is you know, it seems to me the power, though, of of the evolutionary understanding is science itself and, and really mm. the, the power of science, the authoritative way science speaks in which we understand it, uh, you know, as, as democratic members of, of modernity. I mean, this is something that we all sort of listen to and we're yeah. all, we're always keen to study show. Uh, and, and, yeah. we, and we sort of adjust ourselves in the light there. Uh, and, there, and, I, and I guess with evolution, what I'm trying to say is there's sort of, there's a ground, there's a scientific grounding there supporting uh, these various writers that you discuss in your book, E.O. Wilson, others. And yeah. yet your account, you know, you, your primary authority, I take it, is Immanuel Kant. And, and, and I guess mm. the sort of my question to you is, so what's your quote unquote uh, scientific authority that supports what you're what you're saying here, because when when I hear you say emergent, uh, are are you mm. saying these sort of um, uh, spatial uh, immaterial qualities like love or sacredness or awe or freedom that they emerge out of the material person, or do they come from somewhere else? Uh, I, I would say they emerge out of the material reality. Um, whether, whether they also come from something else is a big cosmological question about the whole world, you know, and I, I don't have a, an answer to that, not in this book anyway. But um, I, I, would, I would say, look, I, I don't have to have, on my view, a, a rival science of the human being. Um, I, I accept what all these scientists say, as long as they confine themselves to the actual implications of their theories. You know, but of course, we, we are, people are always get excited by their theories and run on with them, thinking that, they, that now they have the solution to the next thing and the next thing, um, and overstep the mark. Uh, and that's we see around us all the time, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. because we can explain human altruism as an evolutionally stable strategy, it follows that, that really there's no such thing as human virtue or whatever. You know, and people rush on to, uh, to amend their whole world, worldview on the basis of a very slender fact. Uh, it's a bit as though, you know, if, if you suddenly decided, you discovered, um, as Helmholtz did, that, that all the um, harmonies of tonal music uh, can be understood in terms of the uh, sine waves uh, 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 of the vibrations that, that, that make the pitched, the, 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 the various pitches. You know, you give an explanation in terms of the way in which sine waves uh, fit into each other so that they don't uh, beat against each other and so on. You give a complete account, you say, now I've understood tonal music, I see what explains it. Um, there's, there's no need for me to, to listen to what a musicologist says about uh, the, the real dynamics of uh, a Beethoven quartet. You know, um, and that, of course, would be nonsense. We know that that the, the the scientific theory of tonal harmony gets us just so far. It doesn't get us to that use of tonal harmony in which the human spirit is embodied. So, in a way, it's almost as if we have to we're alienated from ourselves in that the, the ways that Absolutely. we understand yeah, ourselves that, that to be. Yeah. The, yeah, that is the danger with what is sometimes called scientism. You know, science without the, without the modesty which science um, demands. And uh, I think um, and that's all I would say in response to this kind yeah. of uh, view that, that you know, science has said everything. And namely, you know, it, it never claimed to say everything. It, it claims to give a causal explanation. And yeah. it tries its hardest to do that. And doesn't, uh, you know, we haven't got got the full story yet but it doesn't claim to give the meaning of things you talk, a completely different form of understanding you talk, you talk a lot about in in the book on freedom ways in which we know mm. we're free one of which you say is language 
and communicating with other people about our actions or trying to understand their actions or how they understand our actions. Mm -hmm. And a question I wanted to ask you when I think was reading that was, what about though the mind of modern man, which is, I think it's safe to say, has a nominalistic understanding of language. Uh, that it's, this is a deeply uh, willed phenomenon we're engaged in. Mm. We, we'll, we'll just, I mean, there's also the evolutionary account of language. We'll, we, I think we've talked a lot about that, but uh, this sort of nominalism, you know, that language doesn't really describe essences or forms of things. It can't. It's just sort of something we, we tell ourselves. We give a name to something. And, and, and of course, the deeper consequences here are uh, understanding our actions to be largely relative, uh, you know, and so there's no real content or meaning to what we're doing. Or to what well, we're saying we're doing. This is, yeah, this is a, a big question in the philosophy of language, and, and I, I, I'm not myself a nominalist, uh, and um, I don't... Uh, you know, I don't have a complete theory of language by any means, but I would say the most fundamental fact about language is that in its primary use, it's an attempt to describe how things are. In other words, it's subject to the discipline of truth-seeking. And, and a successful sentence is one that is true to the facts. I would, that's what I would say. I know that's the, the classical anti-nominalist position, but I don't think you can get away from it. Why else did we ever bother to speak if it weren't to communicate about the facts? Of course, there's lots of other uses of language as well. But one particular thing that I wanted to say is this, that, that when we learn the language of, uh, of our mental states, the language to refer to ourselves, to, to each other, you know, as thinking, believing, wanting, de desiring, fearing, etc., all the ways in which we try and grasp uh, other people in terms of their mental motivation. When we develop that language, there's an interesting byproduct, which is namely uh, the the pronoun. Uh, I learn to describe myself using the word I. I say, I fear this, I want that, etc. And then I learn to describe you, not not as he or she, but as you. And out of that, there emerges this extraordinary thing, the I to you dialogue, in which people uh, exchange views about their states of mind, exchange their states of mind with each other directly without having to find out anything, just by expressing it through language. And this completely changes the structure of human relations, in my view. That's one of my arguments. It takes us out of the relations that are within the sphere of ordinary animals into another sphere entirely in which we stand face to face, eye to you, or if you like, eye to eye, um, and deal with each other in completely different terms. And that's part of what freedom consists in. But it's a gift, of course, of the, of the language and of this strange um, articula articulation of the language, which comes about through pronouns. The first person plural, you don't write about it in this book, but I, in other mm. books, I'm, I'm very familiar with you uh, arguing that the yeah. first person plural is really the basis of political obligations and civic freedoms and also uh, loyalty to a public thing, to a political order. Yeah. And, and you situate that, too, within the context of the nation state, uh, which is sort of the form, the political form we Westerners have arrived at, but which has its critics, uh, as you know. Um, yeah. Maybe talk some about that, because I think people aren't aware of, or should be more aware of, that argument for the nation state, as opposed to sort of the endless, you know, the, the social contract, natural rights arguments we know so well. Yeah. Well, I, I, I take the, the view that um, every political organization depends upon a pre-political attachment. Um, just as uh, in a family, all the discussions about what we should do, how we should deal with this problem, how we should, uh, where we should go on holiday, etc. All these discussions presuppose that that we are together in this place. You know, this is our home, and we're 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 making a go of it. Um, in the same way, all the discussions that make up politics depend upon the assumption that we who are engaged in them belong together in some other way. You know, that this that we're here 
by destiny. We're, we're part of, as, as you say, a first-person plural, which enables us to say we. Um, and I, I would say there's lots of ways in which people can uh, get to a first-person plural. I, I might say we Muslims or we Christians, and not that that's a very familiar uh, way of identifying a first-person plural, but it's, um, it's, it's an old way and one that we've moved largely beyond. If, if we start talking about we Americans, uh, then uh, we're talking much more about uh, our residents in a single geo geopolitical uh, region, and, and not, not just residents, but the grant of citizenship that comes from that. And that's, that's what the nation state consists in, a transfer of, of loyalty from things like religion, family, tribe, uh, dynasty and all that to this other thing, the, the country, the country being the, both the territory and the, the law and the citizenship that have, have molded that territory as ours. And I, I think that's a, a huge achievement. It's, it's the way in which Europe solved or freed itself from the wars of religion in the 17th century by redefining itself in terms of the nation state. It went wrong in the 20th century, not because uh, the nation state is a bad idea, but because the nation state was taken over by these totalitarian and nationalist doctrines, which are actually a perversion of the idea of the nation state. Yeah, I know. So, so there we, uh, yeah. No, I don't want to interrupt you, but I was thinking, you know, the, the first person plural is a way of sort of adding something to a social contract understanding, which, so I, I don't take it that you would be denying um, the opportunities of, of constitutional foundings or, you know, subsequent foundings no, of a country, I, but I, it's I think... that we wouldn't, we wouldn't come together to begin with if there wasn't already this first person plural uh, thing exactly. joining us, yeah. You say the American Constitution makes it clear. It says, "We, the people of the United States." Says, That's how it begins, as I recall, isn't it? Yes. Um, uh, and uh, you know, who, you say, "What? Well, who do you mean, we?" And it's so obvious. We are here together. That destiny has brought us together, as a, you know, in the way as it brings a family together. So we know that we're committed to each other. Now we're going to build on that and make it and experiment with them. With a constitution and a procedure, but you can't have the constitution and the procedure without having first defined the, the first person plural to whom it is yeah. to attach. And this is the great weakness of the political philosophy of people like Rawls. Rawls starts off from a social contract, but doesn't realise that he's already he already should have defined the the particular uh, pre-political group who is engaging in that contract. Uh, in the end. He will have to say, well, it's everyone, but everyone where, you know, and, and then it all peters out in vagueness uh, and sentimentality. So your point is, with, with respect to John Rawls, uh, how do we know who gets to go behind the veil of ignorance? Yeah, absolutely. Who, who chooses um, them? Uh, they choose them. They, they confer yeah. it on each other. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is what, in my view, when we start... When we understand this, the importance of the first person plural in um, politics, we begin to see the point of the nation state and how it's not a retrogressive thing, but actually a progressive thing from the point of view of our uh, Western history. Well, it might also help us think about uh, a lot of other incredibly uh, difficult to discuss issues uh, like immigration or, oh, yeah, uh, and, or things like free trade. Uh, and the importance and significance of borders and help us to discuss those in ways that sort of dislodge uh, sort of the you know, instant uh, you know, xenophobia or racist yeah, yeah. comments we and hear. I mean, not that, not that there aren't those elements in these debates or people who are acting from those motives, but uh, that, that this isn't something nefarious to that the first person plural, uh, to the extent it brings in other people, it will be because they have agreed to the same terms that we're in. That, yeah. That we, yeah. Uh, that there's, it, it is a very complex, complex matter, this, of course. Um, uh, and uh, you can only include people in your first person plural if you also have a sense of, uh, of excluding them. You know, if you say it's just everyone, anywhere, then in effect you haven't got a we. 
Um, it, it all fragments into into little eyes. Uh, it's only if if you're really determined to maintain it as a first person plural that you can actually offer to the immigrant anything that that he wants. He wants to belong. Or if he doesn't want to belong, as so many of the Islamists in Europe don't, then of course you have the option of sending him home. Yeah. Well, thinking about, uh, you talk some about responsibility and blame and guilt. And I I guess in a way we've, uh, this, this discussion in a way opens us to thinking about that you're, you're, you're writing about language, responsibility and blame and guilt not being arbitrary constructs or things mm. that are put upon us by various authorities, uh, but that are uh, deeply, according to your view, deeply enmeshed in us uh, as is freedom yeah. and accountability. That's right. Uh, I want to say in the end that um, the concept of freedom gets its sense from our activities of praising, blaming, taking responsibility, calling others to account, and so on. That these activities all are of a piece, and they're all centered on the, uh, on the idea that we each are uh, responsible to each other for what we do. And um, the concept of freedom is a kind of all-embracing posture towards each other, w- which is implicit in those, uh, those ways of talking about, about the world. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't want. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't want to give a metaphysical account of freedom. I don't want to say that you know free actions are, as it were, outside the natural order. They are I- interventions from the spiritual realm or something like that. I think that is nonsense. Or if it's not nonsense, it's not of any use to us. I want to say that the concept of freedom uh, is uh, it's like the concept of a melody. It's um, describing uh, uh, the material in a completely different way so that it becomes part of our dialogue with each other. Uh, That's interesting because you say you're not interested in a metaphysical uh, account of freedom. You do have an interesting discussion uh, towards the end of the book, uh, which I thought sort of opened up, uh, maybe not to a metaphysical account, but you talked about morals and faith and and evil and I, and I guess as I read that and, and this you know this says was it your argument this is Richard's <laughs> imposition on your argument uh, opening up freedom for what uh, freedom for what end for what purposes and it seems mm-hmm. that involves questions both of uh, nature you know is there a nature uh, and also what's the ground of that um, could it be God could it be I'm participating in uh, the personhood of God uh, with with my freedom, and uh, and I, and I, I, I wanted to ask you that, and I say you feel like you have to answer it, but you know, specifically your your dialogue on morals and faith, you you, you hinted at this notion of the sacred, uh, and the yeah. sacred it, it, you, it, it you were saying it just sort of hits us, it, it erupts from somewhere, and we know it, but we can't necessarily give great detailed account of it. Uh, we do lyrically, poetically, etc., but it's just we know we're not in our time uh, in the same way. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, um, gosh, I mean, this is uh, all very difficult. I, t- I touch on this in the, the the other book, The Soul of the World, uh, and I, I, I would like to say that in our approach to each other, in the I to you relation, there's an element of what I call overreaching overreaching intentionality. We, we aim beyond what we immediately encounter in the physical world, you know, the, uh, the, the body and words and gestures of the other, to, the, to their transcendental source, the, 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 the place from which you view me, so to speak. Now, that place is not a place in my world. I couldn't occupy it without being you. So that, uh, and we're all in this predicament that we're, as it were, um, confronting uh, other people uh, uh, and and trying to address them in, pla- in, in a place to which we have no actual access. But yet we, we live with this because we recognize that we are centers of consciousness who address each other from these uh, transcendental positions. And this, I think, means that our whole worldview is 
is uh, instilled with this notion that there is a, a beyond from which uh, the world as a whole is addressed. And I think that that is the origin of the uh, of the God idea, or the the, the right or the right form of the God idea, and it's um, implicit actually in the very beginning of the Bible and in, in Moses' encounter with God in the burning bush. Just that sense, as you know, God says, "I am that I am." Uh, all all, he, all yeah. that Moses encounters is, as it were, the that transcendental point of view which is addressing him. That's all he knows. Um, and yet he's certain that he is being addressed. Um, and I think that's where the, the true religious attitude comes from, that certainty that you're being addressed from a place beyond. Yeah, is this also in a way related? And so we'll step down maybe from the metaphysical sphere uh, a little bit here mm. uh, and just think about contract and consent and we've talked some about the loyalty to the nation state as a part of who we are, the first person plural. You also write some in this book and a lot in, in other writings um, about sort of the, the, the paucity of contract and consent, not take uh, as being the, the sole understanding of human relationships, not being able to take into account the intergenerational perspective. Mm. And, but yeah. this, I take it, is, is also a part of. Uh, personhood, an, an awareness of who we are uh, as, as both yeah. as historical beings um, and, and also as beings who do who raise children. Uh, and, and these are like unchosen obligations that we have to somehow make sense of. Yeah, I, I would say that's a very important point. I, I, I would say that, that we uh, persons, we, li- we exist in time in another way from the animals. Time does not have for us that um, sense of the succession of moments, one after another, which vanish as soon as they've been enjoyed. And for us, time, we're, we're constantly aware of time stretching before and after, and of this moment as somehow a challenge to, to, uh, to, make, to, to join that past and that future together. And um, so we live in time in a completely different way, and, uh, and, and time becomes a kind of mystery to us for that reason. And um, you know, so we, we and we yearn to escape from it in the way that no animal could conceivably yearn to escape from it. And this, um, and th- yes, this informs our our sense of our obligations, uh, uh, and in particular, our sense that obligations stretch. Um, back before our birth and forward after our death. We're only one fragment of the whole network of obligations which, within which we are, as it were, suspended in, um, throughout our lives. So, so thinking about that, so we're, we're trying to escape time, you're saying. Time, time mm. is, is intimately a part of us, uh, and, and we know this, and it's sort of informed, so it, it's shaping us in a way. So th- this and th- this also sort of adds, I think, perspective uh, to human community and mm. and how human community is formed and who's allowed to be into it. I, I was thinking also maybe we have saved the best for last. You, you have a, a section on evil uh, and, mm. and revulsion, and, and, and this is sort of also related to the exceptional human person and maybe we can end by talking about that and how the the, the negation of evil uh, points towards uh, all the things we've been describing as the good uh, aspect yeah. of human freedom. Well, yes, I think um, many people find evil very difficult to understand because they see morality in the way, in the manner of Peter Singer and people like that as, you know, a kind of cost-benefit calculation. Did you see uh, uh, some Peter have a cost? I was, I was going to say, you know, Peter yeah. Singer this week, or yeah, earlier this week, apparently argued uh, the moral acceptability of of raping uh, someone who was severely handicapped, who couldn't give their consent. Did, did, uh, did you I, see I, that? Well, <laughs> I mean, he gets himself, he paints himself into <laughs> impossible corners, uh, of course. Um, uh, but you know, this cost benefit vision. Um, comes up against all kinds of difficulties, and one one difficulty is the evil person. We want we think of the evil person 
as uh, as I say, some, in some sense, a visitor from the beyond. He is not really part of this world. He has a um, his he, the, he's an embodiment of the principle of negation. That the, 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 the there's a he wants to undo the work of creation, so to speak. And this is this you get you know, actually in in sexual matters very much. People that the rapist is somebody who is undoing the created presence of the other person. You know, um, her freedom and her existence as a uh, as a self-conscious being is of nothing to him. He wants to annihilate them almost, to to, to reduce her to, to 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 his slave and to this uh, to the enslavement of her own body. Uh, and everybody feels this as a kind of desecration. Uh, and that that idea that, that that the human reality can be desecrated is fundamental to our uh, full moral experience. And it's a proof of the fact that we all live with a concept of the sacred inside us somewhere. But how can you, because how can something be desecrated if it isn't also consecrated? Uh, and um, there are people who rampage through this world with no sense of the sacred, or if they encounter the sacred, wanting immediately to desecrate it. Um, as, uh, and that was the real meaning of the concentration camps and the death camps. You know, they were they were about reducing the human being to a, a desecrated remnant of himself, so he could be discarded like a like a dead insect. Uh, and uh, I think that 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 sense that, that you know that that evil is a, a kind of metaphysical visitation is something that we all have, and we and and it compels us to understand it in the sort of way that I think these things should be understood, now, not. Uh, as a merely animal or calculating phenomenon, but, but as, as something which, uh, which stands apart in just the way that the human person as a whole stands apart. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. As, as I was reading that part in the book, you know, I was thinking uh, of, uh, of studying uh, the, you know, the, the criminal law of rape when I was in law school. And you know, virtually every state mm. in the United States uh, committed rape as a, to a capital offense. A, or you mm. judged it as a capital offense, you lost your life for it. And then the Supreme Court, uh, in a rather strange opinion, I always thought, said it was a violation of uh, cruel and unusual punishments of the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, and, and it right. can no longer be given such. Now, I mean, I, I suppose, you know, mistaken identities, maybe that's a good thing. I, I don't know. But you know, it, 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 the question in my mind was in your book was, I wonder why we did that. Uh, and, and I, and I think mm. you're after the reason why we did that, and be, because of this this loss that it, that it involves. It's yeah. not just a beating, or or being you know pushed off the road and beaten and your wallet stolen. There's something else taken there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I know. It's a, it's an existential violation. Yeah, but it's yeah. interesting thinking too. Uh, just hearing you talk. Uh, so all sexual relations are now reduced to consent. Uh, can mm. consent bear the weight? What the way you yeah, write? Okay. The of way you write? Can't. Yeah, of course it can't. You you need those other concepts of purity and and desecration and so on in order to see what is really at stake. I mean, this is something which I bring out in my novel, The Disappeared, of course, yeah. which is about rape. Um, but that's another matter. Yeah, no, you discussed it on the program. You, you might remember uh, when it came out. That, right. was, that was interesting. No, you, I remember that's that right. very well. Uh, well, yeah. Roger, th thank you so much uh, for your time today, well, for, for discussing your book uh, on human nature. Uh, it's really been a pleasure. Well, and for me, thank you very much. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.